Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Zojo webinar. I'm Paul of Fever, and today I'm going to be talking about the Zojo Code Profiler. So what is the Code Profiler? Well, it's a way for you to visualize the time that it takes your code to run. And it's built into Zojo. Uh, we'll look at it in a moment, but uh, you can see the viewer here that kind of shows you some of the results we can get from it. Uh, so that's what it is, a way for you to see how long it takes for your code to run. So why would you use the code profiler? Well, you're gonna wanna use it to identify parts of your code that are worth optimizing. And it's important to remember this rule from famous computer scientist Donald Knuth uh, premature code optimization is the root of all evil. That's kind of just the first part of the sentence. But uh, the important thing is that you don't want to focus on optimizing your code too early in the process. You want to make sure you have everything working properly first before you even consider optimizing. And that's where the code profiler is super handy because once you've gotten to that stage, you can turn it on and then use it to help you see if there's parts of your code that maybe are worth taking a look at for optimization purposes. So how do you use the code profiler? Well, super easy. Uh, you just have to turn it on and you do that right from the project menu. There's an option in there called profile code and you just click that, you'll get a check mark next to it that indicates the profiler is now active. And that's it, you can then run your project, use it as you normally would, and in the background, the profiler will be collecting data and usage stats about what methods are being called and that sort of thing, how long they take to run. And then when you're done, you have to quit your app normally. And now this is an important step. Your app actually has to quit normally. It can't have an exception or any sort of crash or anything like that because the cleanup code that runs to gather all the profiler data uh, won't be able to run in that case. So you do need your app to quit normally. And then once you do that, you'll be back in Zojo itself and you'll be looking at the profile results. So uh, I wanna just cover a few tips before we jump into looking at what the profiler can do. And there's a couple special commands that are super useful, particularly with larger projects. There's the start profiling and stop profiling commands. You can put these right in your source code and they only work when profiling is turned on. So you do have to have profiling already turned on. Uh, but what's great about these is what you can do is you can turn on profiling and then in your app's open event, you can immediately call stop profiling. And then if you have a specific part of your code that you wanna just have the profiler look at, you can put in that method at the top of the method, the start profiling command, and that'll just turn on profiling for when that method is called. And that can be helpful because large projects are obviously gonna have lots of things in them, lots of methods and classes and whatnot. And if you profile the entire project, you could get a lot of data back that maybe you don't really care about because uh, you're not necessarily interested in optimizing that. You already know it's fine. Uh, and there's certain areas you wanna focus on. So th these two commands allow you to uh, fine tune the area that you want the profiler to track. You can also export your profile results. They are not saved with your project. So if you do want to retain them for any reason, you can uh, right click in there and choose export and save them to a text file. You can also get profile uh, results from built apps. So those are apps that you're not running in debug mode. And this can be handy if you have a particular say customer or something like that, that uh, you want to be able to gather some profiling data from them using the app, you know, at their location. Maybe they're seeing some slowness that you're unable to replicate or something like that. So you can build your app with profiling turned on. And then when they use this special profile built app, uh, it will create a text file alongside it uh, when it quits with all the profiling data that they can send then send to you. And there is an open source viewer available that uh, you can use to view these uh, 
profile or data text files. You can grab it from uh, on GitHub at Chem Techanize page as the profile reader project. And of course, you can read more about the profiler in the documentation at this location. And a couple optimization tips to point out when you're looking at your profiling data. So when it comes time to optimize, one of the first things to consider is, um, should you use a different algorithm? And we'll look at this in a moment when it comes to uh, sorting. Uh, sometimes, you know, no amount of, you know, code tweaks is going to make something run fast enough for you. And maybe your algorithm is uh, what is not good enough. So maybe you need to consider a different algorithm that can solve the problem in a different way. So that's often uh, something to strongly consider if you need a, a big jump in performance. The other thing in general, when you're optimizing your code, is you want to review your loops. Loops, of course, are things that happen repeatedly, and that is a big cause for performance problems because lots of things are happening there, and if within your loop uh, things are happening that are wasting time, well, that makes the whole process take longer. So a few things you can do that can tweak things and maybe make things run a little faster is remove any uh, variable declarations from within the loops. So uh, just declare them outside the loop. And if the loop has a lot of iterations, that can actually make a measurable difference. You can also move any invariants outside the loop. And invariant is essentially uh, a value of some kind that doesn't really change or doesn't change. And, but if you're calling some, you know, maybe some long running, running function or method within the loop to get a value, but that value is always the same, well, you can move that outside the loop. So you get the value once and then just use it within the loop. And it's surprising how uh, sometimes things you don't consider end up being uh, invariant, they don't change. And you can get a, a boost by uh, just setting those things outside the loop. And another thing that can help in certain specific cases is you can actually inline your function calls. So if you have a really, really long running loop, and it is making lots and lots of function calls, or maybe just one particular function call repeatedly, you might get a noticeable benefit by taking that function and putting its code essentially directly inside the loop. So you're not making an actual function call, which does have overhead with stack management and things like that. Now, obviously you're not gonna wanna do this too often because it can lead to longer, messier looking code. And that's generally also a bad thing. So you have to balance that uh, aspect of the code versus what you get for the performance improvement. But it is something to consider. All right, so let's switch over to Zojo and take a look at how the profiler works here. So here I have a simple project and it just sorts some uh, integers a few different ways. So, First thing you see here in the project menu, profile code is right here. I can click that. Now there's a check mark next to it. So that means the profiler will now run the next time I, I run or build this project. Or I should say be used. So now if I run the project, I can have it do what it normally does. So here I'm just gonna have it fill up some random numbers, and I'll click the sort button. This initially is going to use a very slow bubble sort. And there the results are back. You can see they're sorted. And then when I quit, we can see here, we now have a new section in the navigator called profiles, which has our profile data here. And we can see the methods that were called. Now, as I mentioned, this is a very simple project, so it only has a couple things. Uh, obviously, you run your larger projects, this will be filled up with all kinds of classes, windows, methods, etc., that have been called as you were using it. And you can see here, when you do scan your project, you wanna look for the things that obviously have uh, large values. So, uh, and you got a few columns to look at. So you've got number of times something was called. So if something is called a lot of times and you're able to improve its performance ever so slightly, 
multiplied out, that could be noticeable. So that's something to consider. Uh, the total milliseconds for how long it takes to run something might be important to consider. But you have to balance these things. So if something is somewhat slow, but it's only called once, maybe that's not as important to address as something that's slightly slow, but is called, you know, hundreds of thousands of times. So, you know, that's the analysis you have to do for your own apps. But uh, these are things to consider. And then you get the last column. Here's the average that, you know, just tells you, you know, for each call, how long it particularly takes. So all three of these you can look at to help you identify areas of your code that maybe you want to consider looking at. So in this case, you can see here the bubble sort method wasn't very speedy. Uh, it took uh, a little over three seconds to sort that data. So what can we do about that? Well, we can switch our code. So let us switch to a better bubble sort. So the original bubble sort is just pretty standard. Bubble sort, looping through, swapping values. The better one uh, skips over any items that are already sorted. So you can think of this as a, you know, all right, I'm trying to optimize my existing code to make it a little bit more efficient. And what I can do here is I can click on this results here and I give it a name. because we can have multiple results stay here for comparison purposes. So if I run this again, it's gonna use our better bubble sort method. And we can see the results there. And we can see this is a bit faster about a second faster. So that's cool. We made a one second improvement on something that was about three seconds. Um, you know, overall one, uh, three to two seconds isn't, you know, large difference, but percentage wise, that's pretty good. Uh, but can we do better? So the next thing to consider is, well, what if we switch to some other alternative algorithms that can do some sorting? And you'll see here, I just have uh, in the comments, uh, this is uh, what's called big O or uh, notation for indicating the overall uh, performance of an algorithm. And uh, they're noting it using mathematical equations. So you can see this uh, bubble sorts are N squared. So they get much slower as the number of values that's N increases. And these other sorts uh, have a flatter curve. They don't uh, increase as dramatically when the number of values increases. So those, this should perform significantly better, hopefully. So we'll try the merge sort here. And I did rename that one. So we'll run this again. That felt even quicker. And indeed it was, that was well under a second. And then the last algorithm tweak we can look at is, well, Zojo actually has built-in commands for sorting arrays. So we could just try calling that, see how that performs. As if you look at the merge sort code, you know, that's a little complicated. Very fast indeed. And we can see super fast. That was 10 times faster than the merge sort. So overall we went from a little over three seconds for the slow bubble sort all the way down to practically instant for using the built-in sort method. So quite a range. Obviously this would be the one to, to use, but uh, you can see the difference in the progression here. And because they're all here, I can jump between them to keep reviewing them, which is pretty handy if you're working like between, you know, code that you're actually trying to tweak and you're making your changes and you want to rerun to see if your changes had any effect. Because that's important 
Uh, it, it may be that you make a bunch of changes and they don't have any noticeable effect and perhaps they made your code a lot worse. Well, that might not be worth keeping. Uh, but if you run it again and you're like, okay, I ran it last time and it took this much time and then I ran it now and it takes this much less time, that's great. And you can track that. You can also right click here in the profiler area. I can pick save as and I can save this to a text file if I want to retain these later because these will not be saved with the project. So if I save and I reopen the project, this section uh, won't come back with the project. The other thing you can do here is uh, if I build, you get this dialog here to let you know that you're building with profiling turned on. Now you may, you normally are probably not going to want to do this. Uh, turning on profiling does slow down your app because it is doing a lot of stuff in the background to keep track of all this. So you only want to turn it on when you're like, you know, debugging and testing uh, and you're at that stage, or if you need a special build, like I mentioned earlier, to give to someone because you need to do some additional analysis. So the dialog here is just uh, letting you know that, hey, profiling's turned on. So you're going to have that extra code in your app and you can click OK to do the build. And that's really it for the profiler. It is uh, built in there. Maybe you hadn't seen it before, but it's easy to use, can be super handy, and worth trying out for your apps when they have, when you've mostly finished your development and you have things working the way you want. You can always reach me via email, paul at zojo.com. I'm also on Twitter, just at Lafever. Love to hear from you. I want to thank everyone for attending. Have a great day.